RTQPCR stands for Reverse Transcription Quantitative Polymerase Chain Reaction. Sometimes you'll also see RT stand for real time because you're measuring in real time. All that mumbo jumbo makes it sound really complicated, but at its heart, the concept is simple. The idea is to measure how many copies of a specific protein recipe there are to get an idea of how much of the protein is being made, um, often in different cells or tissues at different times or under different conditions, like with or without a drug. The, um, there, because there aren't very many copies originally present, not enough to measure at least, you make a lot of copies of those copies in the process of PCR and then you count those copies as they're made to see how many you have. The RT step is needed to turn the RNA copies into DNA that you can copy and measure. So let's break it down a little. So the original recipes for proteins are sequences of DNA called genes. So a gene is just a stretch of DNA in a long, long piece of DNA called a chromosome. And so different genes specify different proteins. And these proteins are made by complexes called ribosomes. But you don't go directly from the gene to the protein. Instead, there's an intermediary called messenger RNA. So what happens is an RNA copy of the gene gets made in a process called transcription. That copy gets edited. There's some um, regulatory regions called introns get removed. Um, it gets this cap in this poly um, adenosine tail, which is going to come into play later. So A is just one of the RNA letters. So this tail is just a long string of the letter A. These messenger RNA copies then get used by the protein making complexes called ribosomes to make protein. So for each mRNA, you can make um, a lot of protein. This isn't, there's not like a hard and fast rule of how many you can make per copy and it varies depending on the um, mRNA. But the basic idea holds that the more mRNA copies you make, the more protein you can make. So if we have an idea of how many mRNA copies there are, we can get an idea of how much of the protein is being made. And RTQPCR let says do this. So the RT stands for reverse transcription. And so remember how we said that the gene to RNA, that the DNA to RNA step is called transcription. So that's what normally happens. In reverse transcription, we make a DNA copy of that RNA. And we call this cDNA for complementary DNA. Because the um, DNA strand we're making is the complement of the mRNA strand. So what we do is we make the cDNA, and then we copy just a specific region of it that we're interested in. So we want to copy something that's specific to the, um, the gene that we're interested in, or whatever we're interested in. Um, so it's some feature that's um, sequence that's specific to that, and it's not going to um, be copied anywhere else in the DNA, so you don't get like a false signal. And then the qPCR part, the quantitative PCR, this says, let's just count the copies as they're being made to tell us how much we started with. So the more you start with, the more copies you'll end up with, the faster. And so PCR works in this um, cycling method where each cycle, it's exponential. So you're, um, you're growing exponentially. And so you grow really, really fast how many copies you can be made because each cycle, each copy gets, in, gets doubled. Um, and speak, so it might, you might think, why are we doing this copying? Well, even though there's a lot of um, copies to begin with, the, there's not enough to actually visualize. And so how are we actually gonna visualize this though? With this, we use fluorescent probes. So fluorescence is um, basically where you, Molecules, you can shine a light of one wavelength at them and they'll give off light at a different wavelength. Um, so the primers are going to specify where the D, what stretch of DNA gets copied in the PCR step. And so if you're confused about PCR, um, go back and watch that video. Um, so you have primers that are specific to the region you want copied, and then you need a way to actually visualize them. Um, so probes are going to bind the copied DNA.
So what was traditionally done was using a double-stranded DNA or DSDNA binding dye. Um, so these dyes would bind non-specifically to any double-stranded DNA. Um, so ideally, only you'll only have double-stranded DNA if copies are getting made. So if there's and that the amount of double-stranded DNA you have will be proportional to the number of copies. However, if there are non-specific products being made and that sort of thing, you can get high background. So more specific um, probes came along, like reporter probes like Tacman. So basically these probes use something called FRET. So at one end of the probe is a molecule called a fluorophore. Um, so that's what's going to give off the light. And at the other end is a quencher. Um, and how it works is that if the floor floor and the quencher are close, then the quencher is going to kind of steal the light that would have been given off. And if the floor floor and the quencher are far away, that light will be given off. So when these probes are cleaved, the floor floor and the quencher come apart and you see the fluorescence. And in um, the qPCR, when the DNA polymerase, so that's the DNA copier, when it comes to um, into contact with one of these, it's going to like chew it apart. Um, so the fluorophore is going to get um, freed from the quencher and you'll see fluorescence. So you design these probes that bind this in between in the um, on the strands of the copied DNA. And so then each cycle when the polymerase goes to copy it, it's going to release the fluorescence. And the more copies you have, the more fluorescence is going to be seen. Um, and so, as I mentioned before, PCR occurs in cycles. So, um, you you doing? So the probes are going to bind in, during that annealed step. So after you make a copy, you melt the strands apart. The primers bind, and the, and the probes bind. And then when you ex do the extension, the um, DNA polymerase is going to free the fluorophore from the quencher. Um, and so because you have these cycles and you have the fluorophores being freed um, for each cycle, we are going to talk in terms of cycles when we quantify things. So basically, the, um, sorry, the threshold line, that little jaggy thing should be below the threshold line. But so basically the idea is that the more fluor, the, um, this is measuring fluorescence on the X scale. Oh, sorry, on the y-axis and the number of cycles on the x-axis. So the more copies you start with, the faster the fluorescence is going to rise because fluorescence is corresponding to the number of copies we have. So there's going to be some background, some noise. And so this is going to set your threshold level. So the threshold level um, is going to be what you use to quantify things, whether or not, like how, how many cycles do you need to get above that threshold? So in the beginning, you're going to have this exponential increase because you're exponentially increasing the copies, but you're not going to be able to tell because the signal is going to be hidden in the noise below the threshold. But then you get in that green zone where you're in increasing exponentially and above the baseline. So you can actually measure this, but then you start running out of things, um, primers, DNA, um, letters, etc. And so you reach this plateau phase in the red. And the CQ or the CT is the number of cycles required to get above that threshold. So as you can imagine, the, um, the more starting copies you have, so the higher expression of that gene, the lower the CQ or the CT, um, so that's represented in green. And if you don't have many copies, then you're going to have a lower, um, you're going to have a higher CQ. So the important thing here, though, is that you're copying DNA, not RNA. So first you have to make the cDNA copy from the RNA through reverse transcription. And we can do this because of the properties of DNA and RNA. So DNA and RNA are nucleo, nucleic acids, so they're nucleotide letters. Um, they have this generic backbone part and these unique bases. And so basically DNA and RNA can, base, can specifically base pair um, to one other letter. Um, 
And so you can make copies of DNA from RNA and copies of RNA from DNA and copies of RNA from RNA and copies of DNA for DNA, but you need different um, protein helpers, el enzymes to do this. So what, um, what we're doing in PCR is copying DNA to DNA using a DNA dependent DNA polymerase, um, usually some modified version of TAC polymerase. Um, so this is what we do in PCR, and this is what our cells do when they replicate our genome, so copy everything before dividing. DNA to RNA is what our cells do to make those mRNA copies, um, and that's done with the DNA-dependent RNA polymerase. What we want to do in reverse transcription is go from RNA to DNA, um, so that uses an RNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So we have to give it somewhere to start, so we use primers for this too. But the important thing is that this is like a pre-step. So this is the first strand cDNA synthesis step. So it's before you do the actual PCR step, although some methods like combine these steps. Um, but this is like a generic step. So basically you're rescuing all of the RNA or um, a subset of the RNA that's present. Um, so RNA is more fragile than DNA, and also we need DNA to be able to copy it with our DNA-dependent DNA polymerase. So basically we need to turn the RNA into DNA before we can copy it in PCR. So one way to do this is with um, oligo-DT primers. So as I mentioned before, the mature mRNA, it gets this poly-A tail. And so as we saw on the last slide, A pairs with T. So if you have a... Um, a stretch of T as your primer, then you're going to um, make copies, DNA copies of all of the tailed mRNA. Problem is that these tails can be really, really long. So the if you have a primer and it happens to bind at like the very end of the tail, then it might just copy most of the tail and then run out of steam before it gets to the gene or not copy much of the gene. So a way to um, improve this is with anchored oligo DT. So basically these have a stretch of T, but then they end in a letter. And so if you put some, some ending in G, some ending in C, some ending in A, um, <clears throat> then what happens is this can only bind to the starting of, start of the tail. And so then you copy directly into the gene. But what if you want to look at non-tailed RNAs? This isn't going to work. Um, but random primers will. So you have a mix of um, short primers with a bunch of um, random sequences. And so they'll, by um, chance, bind to um, the gene and sequence and make copies of the mixed DNA of it. And so sometimes you'll use like a mix of different types of primers too to optimize everything. But as I said, that generic first step is the same for everything, but then you have to design the primers um, and probes, if that's what you're using, um, specific to the sequence of interest for the PCR. And you want to make sure that these are specific. Um, and so this is just one way to measure gene expression. So um, we're measuring mRNA levels. Um, other ways to do this are microarray, which is kind of like the same idea, but in a more high throughput manner on like a plate with lots and lots of these reactions occurring. Um, and northern blot, which is more complicated, um, but it's like a RTQ-PCR largely replaced the northern blot, except that northern blot can tell you about things like um, modifications and that sort of thing that happened to the mRNA. Um, you can also measure transcription or decay or translation. So this is just one tool in the biochemical and molecular biological toolbox. Um, so I hope that helps.